principal of Smithsonian Associates, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our program tonight, Byzantium Rome's Lost Empire, with our speaker, Mr. Lars Brownwork. Thank you all for coming out on this rather inclement evening, and uh, we appreciate your perseverance in getting here tonight. Before we begin, if you haven't already done so, please silence all cell phones or anything electronic. Uh, we'll all appreciate that very much. You probably noticed that Mr. Brownworth's book, Lost to the West, The Forgotten Byzantine Empire that rescued Western civilization is available just outside the auditorium, and he'll be happy to sign copies for you immediately after. Program. Lars Brownwork is in the early stages of a productive and distinguished career. He received his bachelor's degree from Houghton College in ancient and medieval history, minoring in philosophy and science. For eight years, he taught at the Stony Brook School and traveled extensively during the summer to Italy, Turkey, and other places. And Lars, with the encouragement and help from his brother, ultimately created a podcast, 12 Byzantine Rulers. This has become one of the phenomena of the podcasting world, ranking in the top five educational podcasts on iTunes and in the top 50 of all podcasts. But thankfully, books still exist, and we're happy to have his first book with us tonight. So please welcome Lars Bradford. Well, I'd like to say thank you to the Smithsonian Institution uh, for, for having this, and especially thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what to say today, how to start off, and I was staring at this picture here to try to give myself some motivation. It's a picture of Romulus Augustulus, that's one of his coins. He's the last Western Roman emperor. And that's a man who lived about a thousand years later, Constantine XI, who's the last Eastern Roman emperor. And as I was thinking of what to say, I realized I, I can't talk about the Disney Beans tonight. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint. Please don't leave. Um, but I really can't because there's no such thing as a Byzantine empire. Nor is there such thing really as a Byzantine. Uh, they called themselves Roman. They were the eastern half of the Roman Empire. Uh, so it was logical for them to refer to themselves as Roman. And they got the name Byzantine as an insult by people who wanted to specifically say that they were not Roman. Uh, in the 18th century, Westerners started writing things like the following quotes. Montesquieu said, Byzantine history is nothing but a dull mix of rebellions, sedition, and treachery. It doesn't sound too dull. <laughs> Napoleon wrote, he warned his soldiers, hey, don't be a joke to posterity like the Byzantines. <laughs> Edward, Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, in his magisterial decline and fall of the Roman Empire, wrote, you know, it's hard to find people throughout Byzantine history that deserve to be rescued from oblivion. <laughs> and my personal favorite, uh, Voltaire, wrote, Byzantine history is an embarrassment to the human mind. <laughs> you know, a name is an important thing. If you think back to the biblical story of the Garden of Eden, the first thing Adam does when God shows him around the garden and says, this is you, is he names everything around him. There's something powerful about him, something uh, of ownership and identity in a name. Uh, and what I want to know, and it's always a tragedy when you get your name from someone else and you can't name yourself. And what I want to know is, how does the East and West get so far apart that this man is a Roman and this one is, when they both have a direct line of emperors dating back to Augustus Caesar? And the answer to that question really the disregard of the East and the West, the gap between the East and the West, 
starts with a bath, oddly enough, in the year 668 with the Emperor Constantine II. That's him on the left with the impressive beard. Uh, he was 11 years old when he became emperor, and I think the beard is an attempt to add a little gravitas to say he really knew what he was doing. Uh, he was in charge of the situation. Uh, but he was the last emperor. I start with him because he was the last emperor to preside over a unified culture. We tend to think of, uh, with good reason, of the Mediterranean Basin as not one culture, but fragmented. Um, here's the empire of Constantine II that he inherited. There was no significant difference, culturally speaking, between the lands, say, of Italy and the lands of North Africa, uh, Egypt, Asia Minor, the uh, southern tip of Spain. There, there were differences, there were regional differences. But they were largely uh, the same culture, north, south, east, and west. Uh, that culture was the, the language of the empire, the entire empire officially was Latin, as it always had been, but everyone spoke Greek, at least in the West. This is an inscription in uh, the Celsus Library in Ephesus, Western Turkey. Uh, you can see there's the uh, Latin inscription and the Greek inscription for, uh, for everyone to read. It's officially a Christian empire, but that does not by any means entail everyone's a Christian in the empire. In fact, paganism was alive and well as late as the 10th century. You can always tell what's going on by what laws are passed. If they're passing a law against something, it's probably going on. And in the 10th century, a Byzantine emperor had to pass a law saying you couldn't use bears to foretell the future. <laughs> But the Olympic Games, uh, celebrating the pagan gods, were only stopped in 393. And pagan gods popped up in motifs, even in, in Christian circles. It was just part of your culture. Uh, this, for example, is a uh, scene from a uh, place in Italy. This is the baptism of Christ. He's there in the middle, standing in the, the Jordan River. There's the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. There's John the Baptist earning his nickname. And over here, you have a rather amused looking river guy. <laughs> sort of disconcerting. Uh, the uh, empire also is a place of startling social, social mobility. You, we tend to think of empires as being hierarchical and restrictive. But the Eastern Roman Empire wasn't. Uh, at least not as much as we think. It was mostly composed of peasants. Here's a scene of tax time. Um, this man is paying his taxes here. He's paying the taxes. This guy has to make sure he has his scales, make sure you're not shaving any of your coins. And uh, there's the tax collector. Uh, the bulk of the population of the empire were peasants. Um, but you didn't necessarily have to stay that way. Also, interestingly enough, farming tended to be communal. Uh, I would share my pigs, you would share your goats, and, and the guy would share his grain. And if you couldn't meet your taxes, if you couldn't pay your taxes, there was a certain law again in the 10th century where your neighbors, your wealthy neighbors, had to pay your taxes for you. That would be nice. Um, there were more than one emperor that started out life as a peasant and became an emperor. There was one who started out life as a wrestler. Uh, and became an emperor, and uh, that held true for women as well. Uh, there was one empress in particular, Theodora, who started life as something like a prostitute. Her father was a bear keeper, uh, and she ended up becoming empress and running the empire. Uh, one way to get higher uh, socially was to join the army, because after 20 years, you could you get your land, your proverbial mule of 20 acres, and you go and retire somewhere and start farming. If you make enough money, you can buy your way to the Senate uh, and then start a political career. 